Welcome back, Spin TV. This is the 2015 Aussie Open, the first major of the year, the first major in the Southern Hemisphere. We've got nine more holes to play. We've got seen some great action so far on this really tough Mundaring Disc Golf Park course. And I've brought in the man himself, the best promoter that this game has ever seen, the number one guy, the man behind Disc Golf Park, the man behind getting this major to Australia. UC Maresma is here with me. Welcome back. Thank you, Jamie. And this time around, you have uh, special knowledge of this course. You are one of the course designers, and you are one of the main reasons that this tournament is here in Australia. How excited are you to have this event pulled off after all these months of planning? Uh, it's a great honor, first of all, and obviously I'm really uh, excited about this opportunity to bring this golf in this country because I think Australia is a fantastic country for this golf and especially this Mandaring uh, golf course that we got you know to have as a disc golf park and the major event course uh, the area and the facility is perfect for disc golf and what we tried to do this course was to design a major level course where shooting par equals approximately a thousand rating and definitely were able to do that in the warm-up tournament. Uh, I believe it was a 10.03 was an even rated round. And throughout the whole week, it never really strayed under 9.90. So you're right on target with what you wanted to accomplish. And uh, though the field was a little bit smaller, we still had some really high competition. We had players playing 1070 rated golf all weekend and it's carrying over and, and people are already putting together some great shots today. So with that in mind, you ready to get this thing started? Sure, let's do it. All right, hole 10 is a par four that's 180 meters. The guys have just come off uh, two par threes in a row that are, you know, birdie gets. You really want to get twos on those holes. And this one's a nice uphill S curve. And this one can be tricky in the wind. Tell me about this hole. Yeah, this is actually one of my favorite par fours at the course. And as you see, Ricky, uh, for having the box at the first, you need to get your drive up and right. So you need to get around that. Uh, white tree and actually Ricky was a little bit too short so you need to be far up and right with your tee shot. And Paul McBeth uh, told me that this was the hole that the wind affected the disc most that he found all weekend and it can really make the difference if you have power like Simon shows right there you can actually be looking at a long throw in for eagle but that's Again, you have to have Simon Power. Exactly, and what Paul meant, this is actually a cross headwind where the players are throwing. So now it's a headwind pu pulling and pushing the disc more down. So that requires a really good angle control. And it's definitely even harder to get that angle control when you're throwing these faster discs. And uh, Feldberg is going to, looks like he got a little skid that could have turned into a cut roller and, and been much, much worse. So Ricky is about... I would say 100 meters from the target, but he needs to hit that pretty narrow gap. Let's see how he does it. Oh, actually he went all over those trees. It's a long shot and looks like he's in the woods, so we'll see if he had some putt or not. Borrowed a page from the Simon Lazat playbook going high and uh, Dave Feldberg's gonna follow suit. And harder to see with the gray sky in the background, but there's Dave's dropping out to the right side of frame right there. So. He got caught up in the branches and, and held up. Paul is lining up a actually a, a rock shot, which he, he will execute between those trees on the right. And this is actually about 60 meter approach, and he seems to have it nicely on a green, so that should be a birdie. And that's a nice little window. That's window in the truest sense. You know, you've got the Aussie bush that's down below, and you have the trees and then and the canopies up top. You really need to put it nice height control and speed. Simon is following Paul's route with the P2, and he's also on the green. So these should be uh, some interesting looks. Uh, Feldberg is going to have another long look when his upshots just aren't getting close enough to really guarantee him birdies. And he's been giving him good runs, but just hasn't gotten him to fall quite yet. And uh, Simon went a little long, and he's parked right behind this big tree. Nice straddle putt. And this really shows the importance of if you're going to play this game at this level, you need to have different putts. You can't just line your feet up in one orientation and expect that all your putts are going to be like that. Yeah, and also there is an elevation on this course, so you might end up putting down or uphill, so you need to also master that angle. And Paul does not let Simon take a stroke from him. Um, so Simon stays four strokes back from 
Paul Macbeth, and now he's only going to have eight more holes to play. So Simon uh, needs to start closing this gap a little bit quicker. He, he started to make some headway in the front nine, and he needs to pick it up right through here. But good news, there's some scoring opportunities coming up. And that's going to be uh, Dave Feldberg is going to find a par, and Ricky is going to birdie. So everybody birdies except Dave, that hole. And hole 11 is a par 4 where you're going to squeeze the fairway down with uh, some artificial OB just to make getting to the hole a little bit tougher. Yes, this hole actually is, uh, you need to make a decision from the tee, even, even you're going to lay up or go long like Ricky is doing in his drive, he, he is going long and now he has a pretty easy upshot, but you need to take a risk if you want to go uh, long with the tee shot. And Simon is actually throwing uh, uh, PD2 and this is also a headwind, so he falls like a couple meters short, so he's actually continuing right where the flags are shown. And he kind of got suckered into that throw. That's right what that OB was designed to do. And uh, Paul is actually having pretty much the same shot, so they are both OB. You can see both of these guys are trying to assert their will and sort of take control. It's, it's almost like an arm wrestling match uh, right down through the stretch here and what I consider to be probably the toughest six-hole stretch on the course, which is 11 through 16. Is. Simon is now facing a approximately 130-meter Anheuser shot, and he's actually throwing a roller, which is a good option also here because there's a lot of room for it, and his roller is going actually a little bit too far. Have a good positive kick on the tree, and he's putting around the circle's edge. Paul uh, has actually the same lie. They went out at the same spot, so he's throwing the backhand Anheuser, and I was actually looking this shot from the behind, and this was one of the best shot of the day, so it was on point and he actually landed on the green and he's like in five meters from the basket. And you know we saw Paul execute that similar shot on hole six, just some great control with his rocks and uh, mid-ranges in general. And that's a nice little putter layup for Feldberg, this is a traditional black putter. Ricky is on fire, this is actually going to be his ninth straight birdie in a row and he's actually trying to catch and getting catching Simon. Yeah, he will be looking at his ninth uh, birdie attempt, which is, that's massive. On this course, you don't expect to see scores like that. Yeah, I mean, the course record Simon and Paul did the other day, 52, was actually a score that I actually didn't believe that people can throw there. So I was thinking more like 54, 55 could be the course record, but these guys are good. And even when you design the tough course, they, they seem to find a way to find that gap and make that clutch putt uh, like Dave does right there. And he's uh, trying to get back on a birdie train. Exactly. And now Paul actually saves par on this hole. And Simon, we saw he missed the putt, so he is now one more behind Paul. So this was actually a pretty crucial point for that chase. And Ricky sinking his ninth birdie and actually getting closer to Simon. That's, uh, and that was right in the heart. That was a pure putt by Ricky. Uh, rewind that tape back when you need to look at some practice film, and that'll really teach you how to put a putt right where it needs to be. Exactly, and Simon is not happy with his score here, so he needs to improve. And hole 12 is coming up. This is another par four. This is probably my favorite hole on the entire course. We've got some absolutely beautiful uh, path cut through from the tee pad. Again, we've got to give a shout out to Ryan Rentilla for all the hard work he did on this course when uh, he was living out here. And uh, you're going to turn to the right and go down about almost 11 meters in elevation change and uh, play the golf hole pretty much. Exactly. This is the hardest par for on the course, actually, when we were designing this nine months ago, this was actually originally par five, but we decided to actually reduce the par to four to meet the major level par. And this requires, like Dave is doing, he's actually turning his drive a little bit too much, but he gets out of the woods. This birdie requires a great tee shot, which is approximately 100, 120 meters straight out from the woods and after the tee shot you are facing like 140 meters downhill shot so this is not uh, any way easy birdie and actually even Paul makes it look easy but that shot is actually one of the hardest on the course. Simon has a little di different route here he's been throwing 
over those trees, which is uh, insanely, those trees are pr approximately 30 meters high. And his execution here has been actually really good. All drives I've seen from him on this hole, they have been on the fairway. And that's that's pretty insane. That's something that, and, you know, only Simon Lazat is going to try to do in a tournament. There's not many like him, and that that's just signature. Ricky here is in a tough spot. This is a very tough lie. Uh, for the backhand, he doesn't have a follow-through from the lie. And the forehand, he's got to stretch out around the tree and get it down, try to get it down over the elevation change in the slope. Yeah, he's going to lay up before the OB green. We're going to see la later that there is an OB green just in front of the target. So Ricky is laying up short and playing for the par. And uh, when you say short, let's uh, make sure that's a relative term because that was a lot of power from a standstill straddle forehand. Yeah, Simon's upshot is actually too high, so it's now fading to the left. Uh, and fortunately for him, it was also a little too short from the OB. Yeah, that was um, definitely not what he wanted to do right there. Paul is uh, lining up with a pretty good angle. So he has straight angle down there, like 130 meters. But unfortunately, he pulls that over. And you can see those yellow OB flags. So that's going to be OB. And this is something, this is what makes this uh, green so tough. Not only does the OB squeeze down and the pin is placed between the golf green and the out of bounds tree line. But with the downhill angle, you really have to control how your disc hits the ground in order to stay in bounds. Yes, and <clears throat> even Dave now is is looking at uh, you know 100 plus meters upshot. He's he's holding a putter, so you can actually throw the putter all the way down there. But you need to be really careful for the angle. And in this case, he just a little missed that angle by a little, and you know goes OB on the green. And this is actually a OB green that Dave found three or maybe even all four rounds. Uh, this hole was tough. You know, Feldberg struggled with this hole all weekend. And Ricky also struggling. His uh, upshot was actually not that good and went like 12 meters behind or actually side of the basket. And also Simon is leaving that a little bit short. You can see with even the top pros, they're intimidated by this tough green. This is a, you can see through the back of of the camera angle right there, it's that's a very tight spot to hit. Exactly. And uh, here's Dave, he's going uh, to be lining up a par save. And he gives it a good run, and it's just a little bit long. So Ricky is now looking for his 10th straight, or actually this is a par putt, sorry. So he, he needs to make this to save a par from, from the edge of the circle. And just gets strong side. Breaking, uh, breaking that birdie streak uh, does still a great run, great follow through. Just didn't quite get to hook in. So Simon has one. Simon got now one back from Paul because Paul went OB. So he actually took that stroke back that he lost last hole. And that ends up being a good play to be short of that green and just go ahead and take the par. I don't know of too many birdies on this hole. I'm, I'm sure there were a few of them, but this is definitely one of the more difficult ones to get, even for 1030 plus rated players. Yes, and Paul finishing his bogey right there. So Paul is going to give up a stroke to Simon, making him only three back with six more to play. Hole 13. Now this is, this is a, a course designer's trick, right? You have a very tough par four, and then you have what amounts to a very easy par three for these guys. You're going uphill 80 meters. There is some OB around the green, so you do have to watch that skip, but it's basically a right-handed hyzer. Yes, this is a must birdie for all of these guys, and there is actually nothing between you and the basket, except that the big branch on, on just before the basket, but these guys are going to skip Heisers, so they are not going to hit that branch. So this is a must birdie. And that is a textbook play. Simon played it perfectly, but you know you have to wonder if you designed that just to make people think about it after playing a really tough hole, giving them the pressure of that must get birdie. Exactly. Actually, Ricky is shooting even better. He's like three meters off the basket. So Ricky is dialed in as you're going through the teeth of this course, and if you're going to be dialed in, that's the time to do it. 
Uh, Dave leaves it short, so he's looking at like 9, 10 meter putt from there. And that's uh, not what you want to be doing, especially after uh, taking a bogey on the previous hole. And let's see, Paul McBeth has just given up a stroke to Simon. He needs to stop the bleeding right here and keep it at three. And Simon's, Simon is parked, so he needs to make it. And actually, he goes OB with this shot, so it was too high, caught the wind, and he definitely is not happy with it. And he's now continuing from the drop zone. This is his third shot. And so this is about a 13-meter, 14-meter attempt from the drop zone going uphill, and that's not, that's not an easy drop zone. He's going to lose now two strokes, so Simon is yeah, getting really close to him. So it's going to be really interesting the last five holes. And Dave going off the chastity belt again. He needs that one to sit down. You can see he's been frustrated all day. This is not a typical putting performance from Dave Feldberg. Yeah, I was actually surprised how much he has struggled inside the circle this week. Obviously, it's an off-season tournament, so you're not probably in your best shape, but especially that was shown in Dave's putting game. And Simon's going to clean up that birdie, and he's going to take another couple strokes from Paul, creeping ever closer. He will now be, uh, yeah, Simon is two back at this moment, so, you know, he's really in his range to catch Paul after this hole, and Ricky making another birdie, so he's also in there. And you have to wonder how much uh, Paul is thinking about this, keeping a five-stroke lead over Simon by playing two rounds of 1070-plus rated golf, and now he only has a two-stroke lead, and the big monster in hole 16 is looming very soon. First, we have to play hole 14, though. And this gives you a really nice view. You have an elevated tee pad. Uh, it's about a seven meter drop in elevation. You're going 235 meters down the fairway, but the OB squeezes down towards the basket and really forces you to pay attention to the angle of your disc and that skip. Yes, this hole is one of the widest, and you can actually go pretty long from the tee shot, but then you need to be uh, in the center of the fairway. And Simon chooses a low, low shot on this and this will actually skip and fade to the left side of the fairway which is the best place to you know go to the green from the next shot and i think this is something that if you're not used to watching these guys play that these shots that they throw you know they may not look as flashy but something that lower rated players to get that power and that soft landing that's years of technique, that's years of practice, and, and that's something that you know separates them from other competitors. Yeah, and that was a great shot from Dave. He actually turned his disc and got a little, little extra distance on that, so he will be facing a less, less hard approach than these other guys. Now, Dave's was about, that's about the best drive I've seen on that hole all weekend. And uh, Paul's gonna get a skip, but he should be okay. So the next shot you need to execute is the right-handed hyzer, uh, kind of a playing with the OB lines, and actually Ricky is pulling that over, so there is also an OB behind that Ricky finds, unfortunately, so he is out, out of bounds. And this is another one of those examples of a very tough green to hit. You are gonna see the golf green is out of bounds, the basket's behind it, and it will hook around and the OB is to the left and behind the basket. So you really have to follow that uh, fringe of the green, the hill, and get it up there. Here's Paul with his trusty rock three. That's a perfect, perfect shot. And you cannot do it better than that. I don't care who you are, how many times you play. That's, that's one of those you know, very few times a season shots that you're gonna see from a guy like Paul McBeth. Yes, and now he is putting actually extra pressure for Simon's next shot because Simon needs to copy that. And Simon's opting uh, for a driver route. He's looking for the skip, which is more common uh, play there, but he got caught up in the branch, and he's going to have a long look to try not to lose a stroke right here. And Dave is pretty close to the target, so it's just, just a small hyzer around the corner, which seems like he got it, and a little more skip, and he would be under the basket. Ricky gets a mark straight from where he went out of bounds. He's a little bit outside the circle, giving it a nice run, just a little bit high. 
Yeah, now now Simon needs to make this because he doesn't want to give a stroke to Paul and this is actually a pretty pretty difficult putt. And if there's anybody that has a good chance of making this putt, it is Simon Lazat. Just low. Off the cage. Just by the just by the nubs of the cage, he could have snuck that in and it that's that's a top level competitor right there. And great putt from Dave. Just we were talking about his putting and now he's finding that rhythm again. He took a little bit more of a hyzer angle on that putt yeah, than I I've saw seen that. him. And uh, I guess, you know, when you think about that, trying to get that to drop into the chains when he's been putting high, that's a good mid-round adjustment. Yeah, and that was actually a, a more aggressive putt that we have seen from him. And Simon's going to clean up for par. And that that's where his upshot landed. That is... That's an 1100 rated shot right there. Yeah, that's it's a downhill shot and you can't see the whole green, so it's a, almost incredible. Like the man has no rust on him, practicing all off season. You know what what can you do to beat him? You need to try to get hole 15, par 3, 120 meters, and you're going to see the green or uh, the fairway, excuse me, sloping down from right to left, and that's going to cause a lot of the players to play a skip shot. Yeah, and you can take this almost as wide as you want. So let's see how Dave chooses the lines. He's going the wide route, but he's having a overstable driver and we are looking for a nice, good couple of skips and a little rolling and he's almost parked. That's a great, that's a great shot because the OB is to the left in the tree line. Uh, you carve out a little bit of a keyhole almost um, by the basket, but if you get a big nasty skip and a little bit of a roll, it's easy to go out of bounds. Yeah. And I saw the other day Paul going way too long on this, and it seems like that he has the same line. So he's like 15 meters past the basket, so that's, a, <clears throat> that's too long. And he would probably be much worse, but he got a very fortunate roll um, back towards the basket. It looks like he'll be about circle's edge. And Simon needs to capitalize right here. And it's challenging the OB, but it looks like it's going to stay it's in. It's, uh, that's one of those scary... Scary moments when you're waiting for that disc to slow down. <clears throat> Somehow Ricky doesn't have that skip, so he's going to be well short from the basket on the right side, so it's going to be a long long putt, or actually it's an up, it's an approach. He's not going to try that because there is a OB behind the target, so it's just a you know, tap, tap in par. And if you play this back and watch, you know, one of the most important things to notice when you're trying to get a different kind of skip is watch the left side of the disc on that right-handed hyzer, and that's really going to tell whether it flares or whether it gets a little baby skip or whether it just kind of sits. And this is a big, this is a very big moment for Paul McBeth right here. Oh, that was a kind of a drop by the wind, so now there is a perfect time to Simon again gain that stroke back and get within two strokes when there are only three holes to play and that's what Simon does, he doesn't miss those holes. Taking no time at all, no time to think about it or get razzed, he puts it right in the chains and he's going, he's back to two behind with three to play. Yeah, and Dave is now looking for another birdie. He's gonna tap that in and, and make the birdie. And that's a great Come back for Dave, who uh, was struggling on the putting green earlier, and he's going to come and get two birdies in a row. Ricky will clean up for par. And uh, Ricky's uh, out of reach for most people at, at this point. You know, it, it would have been tough to catch him anyway. Uh, he is creeping up on Simon a little bit. So this round is not over, even though there's only three holes left to play. Speaking of which, hole 16 is a monster hole. It's more like the two holes. It is... 375 meters that is over a thousand feet for uh, us americans thousand and 1200 feet actually 1200 feet then my mental math was not quick enough for that and uh dave feldberg's gonna go for a roller yeah roller is actually a pretty good option for right-handed players if you get it down on the right angle you can be pretty safe wherever it's going because it's going to be a downhill slope from right to left, so roller is a good choice. Simon is not throw, rolling his, he's, he's, he wants to go big because he needs to put the pressure on on Paul. And unfortunately, his drive is not turning enough. It's a long one, but it's still fading too early and goes OB on the left. 
And that's the danger of throwing really overstable disc. You can definitely get that distance on that anti flex shot, but if you don't force it over on that ante, you're going to carry out, especially throwing downhill. Yeah. And being two strokes behind at this point and going OB, it's a really hard break for him. Now, now everything needs to go for him if he wants to win this. So Paul, I, he needs to just land safe, and th this is what exactly he's doing. So that's a great shot from Paul right in the middle of the fairway. Took a lot of pressure off of Paul by throwing out of bounds, and uh, Ricky will go for the forehand. So we're seeing uh, a few different lines, and Ricky kind of got over on it, but it seems to be safe. Yeah, that was a good break for him, and now he's actually looking for, you can see those three uh, bigger trees on the left side of the fairway. They are approximately 120, 30 meters away from Ricky, and Ricky has a great drive here again, and he's pretty close to those trees, so he's looking for a 100 meter approach. Good setup to get up and down and get that birdie. Um, you know, you, you can only imagine that Simon was trying to go for the eagle there and grab those two strokes on this hole because the next two holes to finish the course are par threes. Exactly, and <clears throat> Dave is playing safe in the middle of the fairway, actually skipping to the left, but he is still safe and looking for a pretty nice and easy upshot. And uh, so the basket is down and it's towards the right, so you're again going to play a golf green to the left and a little bit deep of the pin and the OB going down the right side tree line. So this is not the easiest angle for a right-handed, backhanded player. Yeah, Paul has his distance destroyer and actually gaining a lot of distance, so that's far away down downhill there. And you can see that it's sloping more and more at the end of the end of the fairway, so it's actually a pretty nice downhill shot that Simon is also seeing. And somehow he's leaving that well too low and have those unfortunate skips and the headwind actually helps to keep the disc up and he goes OB again. And he's he was not happy with that. It, it looks like it kind of slipped out of his hand and got low. I can't imagine that he was trying to throw between the trees. Um, as, as much as he does like to show off that arm, that probably wasn't the route he was going. Yeah. Ricky's sidearm is crazy and now he's almost hit the basket then stayed in so he's like seven, seven six meters from the target. That should be a nice uh, within his caliber birdie look there and so Simon definitely needs this shot to land. Yeah looks like he, he gets it in in close range there are the little skips that we don't see but he's in in the circle. Dave Feldberg going with the putter. Uh, he really likes throwing that putter and uh, he can get some good distance with it. Nice and overstable, staying down in the wind. Great Paul, shot. Paul is so close with his second shot, so he can see the whole green, which is, makes the shot even easier. And you can see that with the angle, with playing the hyzer on his uh, second shot, he got the angle to the green that's least likely to put him out of bounds. And now he's putting uh, without really much chance of going out of bounds. Simon makes his bogey with two OBs, so he will drop some shots against the ball. So I think this is over, but you never know. You never can tell with these guys, but I will say that that was a phenomenal upshot by Simon to get back after going out of bounds twice and give himself at least a chance to save the bogey. Um, that's, that's the kind of play that you need to have when you make a mistake. Pick yourself right back up and, and get back on the horse. Oh, that's a really uncharacteristic putt from Ricky. He doesn't really miss those ones. And that was a kind of odd-looking spit out, too. It hit a strong side low and just kind of bounced back out. And Dave will take the birdie right there, which is very solid. Paul also birdies. Ricky will par, and Simon will bogey. Hole 17. This was the first and second hole ever aced on this course by the three-time world champion himself in practice. Uh, two different discs, very similar shot. Let's see if we can get some ace runs here. That's definitely what it's going to take to put this game back in reach. Dave is coming <clears throat> out first, and he's hyzering his shot a little bit to left from the target. Actually, drops right under the basket. That's a great shot. Yeah, apologize. The cameraman did a terrible job following that shot with the black putter was a little bit hard to find, but that was a fantastic shot by Dave. Next is Paul. He he should know how to play this hole, so let's see. 
That is one of the discs that he aced with. That is his Thunderbird, and that was the first ace on this course. He had the line, he was a little bit long, got held up in the wind a little bit. Yeah, the wind is actually pretty tricky on this hole. You're throwing quite a lot of downhill. Ricky is using his mid-range here, so he can even reach the target with the mid-range. And you can see the wind is holding it up as it's trying to get to the ground and slowing down. And he's going to end up a little bit long. And here's Simon, who really needs some magic to get back in range of Paul at this point. He has a similar line than Paul, so he's going over the basket, and he's going to face a really difficult putt. And he yeah. just walked up and laid it right up under the basket. Uh, didn't Paul want is, to give up anything else, I guess. Yeah. Paul will also play safe. There's nothing you know, you want to risk at this moment. Yeah, Paul, uh, he came up and uh, said, well, Simon laid up, so I had to lay up too. He waited to see what Simon was going to do. Uh, Ricky will make a nice uh, death butt for a birdie. Paul will clean up his par. Yeah, and you can see that Dave is so close to target, like three meters, that's an awesome drive. Simon will clean his par up as well. And we're gonna go to hole 18. Um, hate to call it over, but with uh, four strokes um, and one hole to play and it's a par three, that's, that's really tough. The only saving grace is this is an island hole and it's an uphill island hole. Uh, very tough, especially when there's a headwind coming down that fairway. Finishing the pin is just on the left side of the golf green. Oh, and uh, Paul here right giving in. a shout out to his caddy. Yeah, caddy for me today. It's his birthday. How old? Yeah. 74. 74. 74. Out here walking this course with us. Sports lover. And one of the one of the skippers on the bowls club team, uh, the uh, Mundaring Red Tails. So shout out to them for showing us a great time after the rounds, letting us uh, learn a really popular Australian sport. Dave was <clears throat> releasing the disc really high and he's sailing out of bounds from the left side, so he's going to continue from the drop zone. And he has to worry because Nate Doss has been playing very solid, so uh, we don't at this point yet know uh, what has happened, but you know Nate's right on his tail and he could take that fourth spot from him. And Rick is sneaking in just like one meter in, so he, he's going to be putting for birdie. And Paul hasn't missed this island for a whole week in the tournament. He actually, he's been playing this really well, so I, I expect him to do the same now. There's no reason to think he won't get it. And this is a textbook drive. He's just under the basket. Oh. Really, exactly. Textbook. You cannot play it better than that. And that's a way to seal the victory. You don't have to play safe and lay up. If you know you've been getting the hole all weekend, you might as well just go for it. And Simon is actually making the same mistake that Dave just made one minute before, so he's throwing too high to the headwind, so the headwind pushes the disc to the left. And you see the right to left wind there is a uh, tough. Dave's going to give it a run from the drop zone. They do play it like an island. Simon actually walked up there and threw it. Uh, yeah, he, so. he's a fast guy. <laughs> yeah, he, uh, I think I think he kind of knew that if he didn't throw that in bounds that he just needed to end it and let, let Paul uh, take the victory right there. And see Ricky for birdie. Yeah, Ricky finishing in style, so he made the best round today. I think it was 55 or 56, and great great to see him playing like that. He did, he shot a 55, which is 10 down with two bogeys, so take away those two bogeys, and he'd be right up there with uh, Simon and Paul for a really hot round on this course. An absolute putting display by Ricky Wasaki today. Yeah, and here's the man taking his seventh title and fourth international title. So there is at the moment no one who can challenge this in a real time. And there is nobody in the game that works as hard as Paul Macbeth and that he earns it every single day out on the course. It really is a lot of fun to watch him as he develops. You know, it's you know, they call him the Tiger Woods of disc golf right now and I agree. there's a good reason. I agree. And also having a having a Chris Finn on the on the last hole, he has been making so much work for this tournament, so this is also a moment for him. So I appreciate his work. Everyone give a hand, Paul McBeth, Aussie Open Champion 2015. And if you don't know what Chris Finn looked like and you heard him on the last commentary, that's the dude himself right there. Uh, with his own clothing company made specifically for disc golfers. I, I meant to give him a shout out on the first video, so 
check out Dude Clothing. You know, he he turns around and puts a lot of his money from his own companies into this tournament that he's running. A lot of pride in Australian disc golf. It's a scene that's going to continue to grow with the support of people like Chris Finn, people like you, UC. And, uh, you know, we just can't wait to see what you're going to do next with this tournament. Thank you, Jamie. All right, guys, that is the Aussie Open. I'm excited. I know you guys are excited that disc golf is back. And guess what? Memorial's only a couple weeks away. You guys, keep it locked. Keep it practicing. Play back this round and see what these guys are doing to tackle this tough course. And I'll see you guys in Phoenix.